Discovery class, good morning. When I left home for work this morning, it was minus 16 degrees. And that's why I've got on my scarf. He's just an old friend. I wear it all winter. And I thought today it's still a little cool in the room. So why not be comfortable? I want to talk to you today as we approach the Christmas season. We're almost upon the month of December. And Mark Twain, he said an interesting thing one time. He said, the secret of getting ahead is you have to learn to get started. Well, we're going to get ahead on the story of Christmas, and I want to get started. And this being our first Sunday in December, I thought today a subject that you might be interested in. There were some personalities back in Jesus' birth who missed Christmas. And we're living in a, t a time when people still miss Christmas. And I don't want you to miss Christmas. I want this Christmas season, although we're coming out of the pandemic and it's very slow to recover, I want you to have a sense that Christmas is going to be a special year for you. You grandparents, you parents, you children, I want all of you to be part of the Christmas story. So to get you started on that, I want to talk about that today. And I'm going to begin by telling the story as out of Luke chapter 2. And then we'll move on and I'm going to show you three individuals who should have been there at Christmas, but they weren't. And I want to learn from their personality because I want you not to miss Christmas. So here's the story as found in Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And every went, everyone went to his own town there to be registered. Now back in the time when Jesus was born, let me describe the Roman world to you. The Roman world ran all the way from the country of Portugal in the west, all the way to Turkey in the east. And then if you go south from Turkey, you come down to the northern part of Egypt, Alexandria. And then if you go from Alexandria, all the way back to the Atlantic in North Africa, you come to Morocco and all those points north. Now, because Rome was the ruler, there was a leader over all of that called Caesar. Caesar Augustus was his name, and he was the overseer and the legal ruler of the entire known world around the Mediterranean. Now, being the ruler of Rome, he controlled the power of that nation by taxation. It says in the story of Jesus' birth that everyone, every Roman citizen, had to go to be registered. It didn't matter if you were in Portugal, Spain, Rome, Greece, Turkey, Palestine, Egypt, North Africa, didn't matter. Everyone that was in their jurisdiction had to come and be registered. Now, the Roman capital was the city of Rome. This was the birthplace and the strength of their government. It was there they had the Senate. The ruling tribunal was found in Rome. The army headquarters was found in Rome. All the important government buildings were in Rome. If you ever go to Rome, I want you to take the subway from downtown Rome right down to the southern end of the city limits. And there you're going to find a roadway that's called the Appian Way. Now the Appian Way is just simply a direction, but what it is, 2000 years ago, when this edict was given, there was a mighty highway that ran from the southern coast of Rome, of Italy rather, into Rome, and it was called the Appian Way. 
and in it would come all the governors and all the leaders and all the great warriors, and they would bring everything they had conquered in another country, paraded down that Appian Way. It's still there. You can even see the holes in the, in the rock that's made out of the cobblestone where you could see the ruts of the chariots as they march back into, into the city. And also on the side, you can see pictures of the big shots. Those people that were rulers and generals in the army, there they have their monuments and they're still there. And sometimes, cruelly enough, these people were horrible leaders. They would even welcome some of their great leaders back into the city, including Caesar, by having rows and rows of crucifixions of hundreds of captives dying on a cross as an example of their rulership over that entire nation. This was the Rome at the time of Jesus, when Jesus was born. Now the population of the time was probably between three and four million. We're not sure of that, but we're looking at many of the records of the archeologists and historians as they look back and they're looking at the size of the city, the size of the boats out on the, on the, on the Mediterranean. And as they put all this together, they would find probably a population base of almost three or four million people. Now the religion at the time was the religion of Caesar. He was God. They worshiped him as the deity. And as worship, if you did not worship him, you could be put to death. And if a soldier saw you on the street, he would say to you, Caesar is Lord. And if you didn't agree with that, you could be locked up or put to death. He had that kind of power. And that's what the people were so fearful of when that had that kind of power all over the nation. Israel was a little land at the far end of the Mediterranean Sea. It was just a sliver of a, of a piece of property. But they had there a ruler who was King Herod, and Herod was a Jew. And often what the Romans would do, they would take a leader in their people, raise him up to become sort of a surrogate under their leadership, and he became the ruler of the district. Often they were hated by the locals because they were traitors. Now into this comes the Christmas story. It's a beautiful story. And I think as we begin to read it, you'll see it. You'll understand exactly how it comes. It's found in Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. The scripture says, So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. He went there to register because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and she placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now that's important, that last phrase of that part of the reading. There was no room for them in the inn. Do you know who was the first person to miss Christmas back in that first Christmas time? It was the innkeeper. Are you aware the history of inns back at the early century? The inn at that time was not a Hilton. It was not a Best Western. You did not find any swimming pools at the inn. As a matter of fact, you and I wouldn't even consider them to be an inn. At the time of Jesus' birth, the inn, as recorded in Luke chapter 2, was really a Greek word. And the Greek word is kataluma. 
The meaning of that word is to unloose or to unharness. It was a place to bed animals for the night. Now, when you and I think of a barn, you often think of stanchions, if it's for milk cows. You can have pens if they're for young calves or pigs. And then you'll find that up above is the haymow. Did you ever play in a haymow? As kids growing up, we played a lot of fun, a lot, had a lot of fun in a haymow. But in those days, we're just not sure what a barn looked like. Could have been a cave. But in and around Bethlehem, there weren't many caves. It was hilly, but there weren't caves. Many think that when they're talking about a barn at the time of Jesus' birth, it was more like a drive shed, or we would probably call it a carport. You know, when you have a car, you drive in, it's got a roof over it, but it only has pillars on either side. It's not really a garage. It's just a carport. Many feel this is what that first early innkeeper had in Luke chapter 2. It was a story of a carport where there were loose animals, and the animals that were loose would probably be donkeys, certainly horses. Now remember, at the time of this registration, people came from all over Palestine. Mary and Joseph came from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, which is a distance of 90 miles. That's a long journey. Mary is leaving her mother, her father, probably her midwife, doctor. Not sure what they did back in those days at the birth of a child. But all of her comfort zone was back there in Nazareth, and she and her husband were making their way all the way down to Bethlehem for the birth of this little child called the Son of God. Now we see in the story that there was no room for them in the inn. The innkeeper was probably overwhelmed and swamped by all these guests coming to Bethlehem to be registered because of this edict sent out by Caesar Augustus in Rome. And there they were in this village, and it wasn't very big. It was there they were registered, but they came from all over. Anyone that had their roots there in that town of Bethlehem, that's where they had to come to be registered. And that's where Mary and Joseph came on that first Christmas day. The Bible says that there was no room for them in the inn. Can you imagine that? The Lord of glory, born in a barn in Bethlehem, and the innkeeper who owned that barn and registered all those animals, he never even came out to see the child. And it was right there on the 50 yard line. And he didn't come and see. Now in those days, if you were a traveler, it was very custom for you, especially in the Jewish community, to stay in a house. You'd never stay at an inn. Innkeepers didn't have a good reputation. I'll get to that in a minute. But if you read Hebrews 13, verse 2, it says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to a stranger, for thereby you're going to be showing that you may be entertaining an angel unaware. In other words, you may have a house guest that'll be the best house guest you've ever had. Well, that would have been the case of Mary and Joseph. Jesus, the Son of God, is going to be born on earth. He who before was with the Father in the creation of the earth, and now he's coming as a baby, and he's coming to an inn that he shouldn't be in. 
If you look at 1 Peter 4, 9, practice hospitality ungrudgingly to one another. It was almost a law that when you traveled and you owned a home and you were a Jewish family, you would bring in strangers, even though you didn't know them. They'd just come in. You'd just bring them home. Or if you go to 3 John 5, Beloved, it is a loyal thing to do when you render any service to friends, especially to strangers. In other words, all the way through the New Testament, you'll find words saying, open your house, invite them in. You can't but be surprised at what you're going to receive when they come in. You may even have an angel unaware. In the Mishnah, that was a Jewish history book. It was written 200 years after Christ's birth. It was read to the synagogue congregation by the Jewish rabbi. And in the Mishnah, a description of the inn, the innkeeper, was given, and they were not held in high, uh, high esteem. The Jewish rabbi, he would teach his people that the innkeeper was really the lowest scale of people in the market. It was really a profession of degradation, really. Animals kept by the innkeeper were often used to worship, and there's part of bestiality. As a matter of fact, the word innkeeper could not be used in the court of law. If you were an innkeeper, you didn't go to the court to give a testimony because nobody believed you. That's how low your reputation was as a person in business. Jesus was born in that environment. Can you picture that? Here was the Son of God coming to earth, and he couldn't have been born in a worse location. And yet God chose that to become the beginning of yours and my salvation. Isn't that amazing? It is to me. So that innkeeper who was resting people in another part of his business, who had a barn and there were unloosed animals and there was a manger and no doubt in the manger there was straw. And in the straw, this little mother would probably lay out her little boudoir that she had brought with her down there to Bethlehem. And there she set the baby Jesus when that child was born. Class, that has to be one of the greatest miracles in the entire scripture. That the Son of God would lower himself. Not to be born in a hospital not to be born in a maternity ward, but in a manger, in a barn, in a stable, with animals, and the only witness was, was Joseph. And there the, together, they brought forth the Son of God. There's a, a second group that missed Christmas, and they were the chief priests and keepers of the law. If you read in Matthew chapter 2, verse 3 and beginning, coming on, the chief priests and the teachers, they were asked by the wise men who came from the east, where is he that is born, king of the Jews? These wise men lived away over in Persia, and they were looking at the stars, and they really followed astrology, but they sensed that there was something very special happening in the ecog of his sky, and they saw a star. And that star was unique to anything they had ever seen. And they noticed it began to move. And they said, that has to be a new ruler born somewhere here in the Middle East. We must go and visit. And if we're going to go and visit, we're going to take gifts. So they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And there they went. And they followed that star. When they got to Jerusalem, they asked around, Where is he that is born King of the Jews? Here's their answer. 
They got the answer from the temple. And they got the answer from the priests in the temple. And here's what they said. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they answered, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of all my people. Do you know who said that? Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. But the priests, when they read this and they told it to the wise men, they didn't do a thing about it. They just gave it out as information and said, yep, looks like something's going to happen there in Bethlehem. It's been said right there by Micah. And that's all they did. Doesn't that surprise you a bit, class? Wouldn't you think if you're going to spend your whole time being a priest and you've been waiting for the Messiah to come and some strangers are coming from a far land and they've made their way across hundreds of miles and they come to your presence and they say to you, we have seen a star in the sky that's led us all the way into Palestine and we think a ruler has been born here in your country. And could you tell us what his name is? Are you expecting a ruler? They have waited for hundreds of years for a Messiah. That Messiah was coming. Those priests taught that in the temple. And now they're saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east, and we've now come to worship him. Class, they did nothing about it. You would have thought they would have gone from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Do you know how far it is from their temple at Jerusalem to that manger in Bethlehem? Two miles. Two miles is the distance here from where I'm sitting in our church at Brentview down to the Calgary Tower. You would have thought they'd gone that far, wouldn't you? No. There's no record anywhere in Scripture that the priests left their position and they went down to find the baby Jesus. Can you imagine what they would have preached the next morning if they had? Can you imagine going into the stable and there you see Joseph and you see Mary and here's the Son of God she's holding in her hand and would you not be a different preacher? I often think I've been cheated because if I could go to heaven and the Lord would show me around for just a couple hours. I don't need to be there for a couple of years, just a couple hours. And I came back to earth. Do you think I'd be a better preacher? I do. Do you think when I did a funeral, it would make sense? I think it would. Because I'd tell them what I saw. They wouldn't believe it, I know, but I at least was there and I saw it. These priests could have gone and seen it. They didn't. They didn't leave their stable. They didn't leave their office to go and see the Son of God. They missed Christmas. Isn't that amazing? Now we've had two missed Christmas. The innkeeper didn't see Christmas and there the innkeeper was right beside him. We find that the priest didn't see Christmas and they were actually right beside it, two miles. They didn't go. And yet they knew the answer because they told the answer to the wise men. And the wise men, after they left their presence, they went out and they took their animal they were riding, probably a horse, and they saw the star reappear and they followed it a couple of miles. And there they found Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. And they bowed down and they worshiped and they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Don't you find that a bit shocking? I do. Here's a third person that missed Christmas. His name was King Herod. Herod, who was he? Well, he was a ruler in Palestine put in place by the Roman government. He was a Jew. And he was often called Herod the Great 
Do you know why they put the word great on the tail end of his name? The reason was because he was a colossal builder. And the building projects that he put up in Judea are still there. He did all the renovations on the Jewish second temple in Jerusalem. He was the one responsible for building that temple where those priests were that gave the announcement to these wise men as to where they could find Jesus. That temple. He built a huge fortress over in Masada. If you ever go to Israel, you must go and see it. You first of all go down the hill, out of Jerusalem down to Jericho. It's about 1,400 feet. And then you go along the Dead Sea. And then you see a way, way up on that mountain, a strange structure. It's called Masada. Now you can walk up. There's a trail that'll take you up. It'll take you all day. Or you can take the gondola and get on the gondola and do the lift and get up. Herod had an amazing, amazing IQ for building. As a matter of fact, when you get to the top of Masada, you'll find there isn't one palace, but there's three. There's one on the east side, there's one on the north side, and there's one on the west side. And the reason was he built it according to the temperature of the, of the day. In the morning, it was nice and cool, and you could see the sun coming up from the east. And then in the very heat of the day, you could go to the north side, and there it was cooler in the shade. And then at night, if you wanted to get and see the sunset, that's what you would do. But right in the plunk of this, now remember he had a pool, he had water supply, but he also had wonderful communication. Between that palace there in Masada and the way the crow flies back to Jerusalem, it'd probably be about 35 miles across the mountains. He had carrier pigeons. And these carrier pigeons, you can still see them. That is, the roosting nests where these pigeons would be plunked and they would send a message on their foot back to the city capital back in Jerusalem. And back and forth came these carrier pigeons. That's not bad mail service. Well, that was Herod. That's what he did. He built roads. He built aqueducts for carrying fresh water. He had mines for digging gold and silver. He had a secret police. And he had a strong police force throughout Palestine. But moreover, he also had his own bodyguards. And some feel that he had over 2,000 bodyguards keeping watch over him because he was a bit of a despot. His body and his life was always in danger. When he died, the kingdom was divided into three Herods, his three sons. There was Herod Archelaus. He had Judea, that's Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Masada. Herod Antipas, he did the Sea of Galilee and everything in the middle stream of the, of, uh, the, the country of Israel. And then the third son, his name was Herod Philip, he looked after the north, that is the Golan Heights and any part north and even parts of Syria today. All right, how does Herod fit into this Christmas story? Let me read it for you in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, the scripture says that he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem was disturbed with him. I wonder why that's in the scripture. Well, I'll tell you why. Herod overflowed with jealousy, and he overflowed with seething rage. No one, I repeat, no one was his competition. The man was so envious of anyone that had any leadership, they were not going to stand in his way. All right, picture it. Here's his palace. In come these strangers from the east called wise men. And they come in his presence and they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen a star in the east and we've come to worship him. Herod thought, somebody's taking my job. 
foreigners have come into this land and they have said they're going to see this new king that is born. Who is he? Where is he? We're not going to put up with that. Now, when Herod heard this from the Jewish teachers, that the king was to be born in Bethlehem, then he says to the wise men in verse 7, he called the wise men and secretly found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for that young child. And as soon as you find him, report him back to me so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard this, the wise men went on their way. But Herod didn't go. I wonder why. Do you know, if Herod had gone, I'm just guessing, if Herod had gone with the wise men to Bethlehem and they found the Christ child, he probably would have been a different man. Do you know that when he died, he had a number of prisoners slain because he wanted family members to be weeping even though they weren't weeping for him. He just wanted people on the streets of Jerusalem weeping, mourning the loss of a loved one, but he wasn't the loved one. Could you imagine if I were reading these words and Herod, hearing what the wise men had said, followed, him, followed them diligently to Bethlehem and together, they presented their gifts. And Herod could have given all kinds of gifts. He was the wealthiest Jew in all of Palestine. He could have given Jesus the moon. He didn't go. The Bible says that he missed Christmas. But it gets bad. I suppose you could say it gets worse. When you get down to chapter 2, verse 17 of Matthew, and having been warned in a dream, the wise men, not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by a different route. In other words, they didn't go back the way they came in. They had worshiped Jesus. They had seen the baby. They had seen the newborn king. They had presented their gifts. And now being warned in a dream, don't go back to that guy. If you think you're in trouble here in Bethlehem with him there, you can't imagine what's going to happen to you if you go in his presence. So they were warned in a dream to go home another way. And they did. Now, when Herod realized, verse 6, that he had been outwitted by these wise men, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys, the little boys, in Bethlehem and the whole Bethlehem vicinity under the age of two. In accordance with the time that he had heard from the wise men. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask a lot of questions of Jesus. One of them that I'm going to ask, who were the parents of these little children, two years and under? Do you know who I think some of them may have been? We're not sure how many were killed, but we knew it was just a wholesale slaughter. Herod, when he found he'd been tricked by the wise men, he wasn't going to have anybody, his competition as a ruler over Israel. So he knew if he hit the ceiling of two years of age, he'd have the ball. Every boy child in and around Bethlehem under two was put to death by the sword of King Herod's army. Do you know who I think some of those little children may have been? 
Do you remember it says, and then there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night? And lo, the angel of the Lord peered upon them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said, Don't be afraid. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Go and see. And they left their sheep, and they went. And they found, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. The shepherds did. And then they left the baby Jesus, and they told everybody abroad what they had seen. Amazing story. I think. One or two of those shepherds was a young dad who had a child who was a boy, two years and under, and that child was taken. I'm going to ask the Lord that when I get to heaven. In other words, it's horrible, horrible what happened at Jesus' birth. Well, why wasn't Jesus? Well, Jesus wasn't slain because Joseph also, the dad, had been warned in a dream not to stay around Bethlehem, but to beat it. And they went south. They went into Egypt, and there they hid. The baby Jesus was spared because of the dream of his father Joseph. So, what have we learned today? The innkeeper, he missed Christmas. The high priest and all his Assistants, they missed Christmas. They were told by Micah, that's where it's going to happen, over in Bethlehem. Go see. They missed Christmas. King Herod, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen a star in the east. We've come to worship him. His jealousy, his anger, tore him apart. He missed Christmas. I ask you, how is your Christmas coming? Are you going to miss Christmas? Are other things going to crowd out the story that I just told you? I hope not. Don't let that happen. Coming up on the 5th of December, here at our church, all the seniors are going to be taking a part, playing a part in Christmas. They're going to be telling the story of the Old Testament prophecy anticipating Jesus coming. They're going to tell the Matthew story and the Luke story as to what happened when he came. We're going to sing carols, a whole number of them. And the audience is going to be the chancel choir. They're going to sing those beautiful carols. Frida Canvisher is our pianist. She's going to be on the keyboard of the grand. And she's going to be accompanying us and leading us in all those beautiful songs. I hope you can come. If you can't, I'm going to have our broadcast live, live stream, as part of the class coming up on the 5th of December. You're going to be part of it. I'm going to put you there. And you can see it too. And I want you to celebrate as we get into the month of December, the coming of the King. I don't want you to miss Christmas this year. Well, I usually close with something as a smile from the sunny side of the street. Joan Rivers, the late Joan Rivers, <clears throat> she was a comedian. And she was single, and her friends used to say to her, Joan, do you have a boyfriend? Yes, she said. Oh, does he live nearby? No. He lives over in that other city over there. Well, do you go to see him often? Yes, yes, every weekend, yes, I go and see him. Well, it must be wonderful having a friend that you can confide in. Yes. Well, you must have a wonderful time then when you go and visit him. She said, no, no, not really. Oh, why is that? Well, because we spend all day just going and visiting his old friends. Well, what's wrong with that? I bet his friends were welcoming you and they'd be like, no. They didn't? No. Well, why not? She said he would take me to the cemetery and all his old friends were underneath those tombstones. So I spent all day Saturday visiting his friends. Thanks for coming, class. 
Next week, I'll look for you again. Please come back. And I hope the temperature is warmer and I don't have to wear this. See you then.